Mm-hmm. That if Bartimaeus were with us this morning, that that would have been his song. I love to tell the story, and especially because it happened to him. And I am glad to know that I have had my eyes open, just as Bartimaeus had his eyes open. This morning, we're going to take a look once again. We're going to go back into our series, very short series. This morning, we'll do Jesus as the eye specialist, Jesus and the blind man. And then um, this afternoon, or this evening rather, we will do the final sermon in this series. We'll visit with Jesus and the demoniac of Gadara. We'll talk about how Jesus handles hard cases. When I was um, in college and studying, I was in pre-med, and uh, one of the things that you do in that is that you study many different things. Um, you're not even if you're going to be a psychiatrist or a um, a general practitioner, you have to study all the fields of medicine. You may specialize in one, but you have to have an acquaintance with all of them in order to have an MD degree. And so this morning, we're going to see Jesus as the eye doctor, the ophthalmologist, um, not just the optometrist, the one that tells us what's wrong with our eyes, but the ophthalmologist who can do something about it. So I invite you to turn in your Bible, if you will, to the 18th chapter, the 18th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 18. And uh, I'm going to start a little earlier than the passage that I have listed on the slide here because I want you to get the context of what um, it comes to pass. So if you look beginning in verse 31, please. Verse 31 of Luke chapter 18. Now, let me just mention to you what's happened in Luke chapter 18. We had, first of all, the man who went up to pray in the temple, and he thought he was better than the other man and he said Lord I'm glad I'm not like this man and the Lord had nothing wanted nothing to do with him he was blind but he didn't know it blind spiritually then um, we saw how um, this man and we saw this last week uh, this rich young ruler who had it all we saw how he uh, appeared to the Lord and uh, Ask him a very searching question. How can I inherit eternal life? And the problem was this young man had another God in his heart. He came with all of the signs of worshiping Christ. He knelt before him. He called him good master. But the truth of the matter was somebody else was on the throne of that young man's heart. And that someone was himself. And so the Lord dealt with his heart last week. We saw Christ as the divine cardiologist. Now this morning, I want to look at Christ as the ophthalmologist, and I want to begin in verse 31. And there, here is an example of how uh, you can have, even though you have sight, you can things be a little bit blurry. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them and I think this is about as clear as language can put it behold we go up to Jerusalem and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the son of man shall be accomplished now this doesn't sound uh, ambiguous at all does it for he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles and shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spit upon And they shall scourge him and put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again. Now notice what the Bible says in verse 34. And they understood none of these things. In other words, they had vision, they had sight, but they didn't see. It didn't match what they wanted. Many of us come to God and we say, you know, Lord, um, I need you to pay this bill. 
Or, Lord, I need you to give me a, a really good health report here. Or, Lord, I need this or I need that. And we just lay it out and tell God exactly what we want him to do. And when he doesn't do it, we don't understand. We say, I thought God was a, a prayer hearing and answering God. But what they wanted and what God was going to give them were two different things. So I say this to you this morning. Even the disciples were blind and could not see spiritually because when Jesus plainly told them what he was going to do, look, they were looking for 12 thrones. They were looking for the fanfare. They were looking for a kingdom. And he said, I'm going to be scourged and spit upon and nailed to a cross and buried. And the third day I'll rise again. And none of that computed. That just didn't fit into their way of looking at things. And so as a result of that, they were spiritually blind. Now notice what the Bible says because we're going to see a very clear example of just the opposite now as we come into Jericho. The Lord has told them we're on our way to Jerusalem and now they're going into Jericho. And listen to what the Bible says. And it came to pass that as he was come nigh unto Jericho, which sets right at the bottom of the hill that leads up to Jerusalem. This is where all this is going to happen. And so he's on his way. He's not coming back this way again. Notice what the Bible says. And it came to pass he was come nigh unto Jericho. A certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. And hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passes by. And he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they that went before rebuked him that he should hold his peace. But he cried so much the more, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood. And commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him, saying, What wilt that I should do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight. Thy faith hath saved thee. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise unto God. Let's ask God to lead us into all truth. Father, lead us now into all truth. Open our eyes that we might see wondrous things out of thy law. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, and for his sake, amen. Think for a minute about which of your senses you would like to lose. If you were told you had to lose one of your senses, to be honest with you, um, that's not a choice that I would like to make. I think God gave us our senses for a purpose, and it is important. I know people who... Uh, because of nerve damage, and I'm one of those, because of nerve damage, there are certain things I can't feel. I can really damage my leg and not know it. And so the sense of touch, the sense of feeling, is something that um, is certainly an important sense. And when you lose it, it is very difficult. Um, I have known people uh, who do not have a sense of taste. 
Um, and I also am one that suffered. I had a very bad doctor when I was a young boy who uh, messed up my tonsils very badly and doing so damaged some of the nerves. And, and I don't have a very strong sense of taste. I, I can taste things that are really sour and things that are really sweet, but I can't do much more than that. And um, so, yeah, I'm very easy to please when it comes to food. Um, and some of you say, well, maybe that'd be the one I'd want to lose. Um, the, the sense of hearing is a very important sense. It keeps us safe and protects us. But to be honest with you, if I had to lose a sense, I think that one might be the one that I would choose because I could shut everything off and go on reading and, and doing what I want to do. It would be... It would be a difficult world and all of that, and I know people who are deaf and can't hear, and it becomes difficult for them to speak, and some of them never even learn to speak. So that would be a, a very difficult sense, but the one that I guarantee you I would not want to lose is the sense of sight. What a world this is that we live in today. How beautiful it is, and all the wondrous things that we see and the things that we take for granted today. Um, the, the looking at a sunrise or a sunset, looking into the face of your child, being able to um, look at, um, at, at your life and, and being able to look at, at your books and, and being, able to, uh, being able to recognize those around you. That is a very great sense, and I think that's the one I would not want to lose. Imagine then you are a man in a time when there is no uh, safety net. There is no uh, way of special training. They've not invented Braille. You can't read. You can't work. And all you can do is sit by the side of the road. We meet such a man in our passage today. His name, we're told in a parallel passage, we don't even really, we're not even really given his name. He was just one of many beggars that sat outside the gate. In fact, the parallel passage tells us that there was not one but two beggars, and one of them, only one of them, is slightly named. He is given the name of his father. His father's name was Timaeus. And to signify that he, he was the son of Timaeus, he was given the name Bar Timaeus. And we know him as Blind Bar Timaeus. I want you to first of all then this morning enter into the mind and heart of Blind Bar Timaeus. I want to look at an unfavorable set of circumstances. And the first thing I would have you to note is that this is a very unfavorable timing. First of all, notice that the Lord Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. This is the last time that he's going to be passing through Jericho until he goes to the cross. He will not come back this way again until his feet step on the Mount of Olives after uh, he returns in his second coming. He is not coming back to Jericho. This is the last time that he's going to pass this way. It is an unfavorable timing. This man realized, I think, that this was his chance, but he did not know it would be his last chance. And I want to mention to you this morning, you are sitting in this comfortable auditorium today, and you are around people who love you and who are caring for you, and you may not realize it today, but this may be your Bartimaeus moment. This might be the very last time Jesus passes by your soul if you're outside of Jesus Christ. There will come a moment when there is no longer an opportunity, and if you don't seize that opportunity, that moment may pass by forever. This was unfavorable timing because 
he was on his way to the cross. He had set his face like Flint to go to Jerusalem. He was in a hurry to accomplish the work of God. Secondly, it's an unfavorable set of circumstance because there was an unsympathetic throng around him. The Bible talks about this multitude. He hears them as they pass by, and he is just one blind man sitting by the gateway, and he hears a great number of people coming. And obviously, as a blind man and as a beggar, he sees his opportunity. What's going on? What's happening here? And the crowd tells him, get out of the way, blind man. Get out of the way and shut up because Jesus is passing by. He doesn't have time for a poor blind beggar like you. He's got big business to accomplish. And what he has to do is so important. And you are so insignificant. And the throng wanted him to shut up. They told him, they said, um, be quiet, hold your peace. Don't say anything. Don't attract any attention. And you know what? The world is saying that to us today. You don't need Jesus. Don't bother with Jesus. There are other things. There's so many things to detract us and to keep our minds focused on other things. And, and the crowd is not sympathetic to Jesus today. Jesus is not something other than a swear word in our culture today. And so the crowd is unsympathetic and in the final place about the circumstances, there's an unalterable truth here, and that is that this man is blind. You see, the chances of him finding Jesus by himself are absolutely nil. He couldn't find Jesus because he couldn't see Jesus. He had heard as all men in those days had heard about this one who opened blinded eyes, who opened deaf ears, who caused lame men to leap like deer. He, he saw and heard uh, the reports that people say uh, about him raising the dead. You see, when you're blind, you don't have the senses to be able to read the newspaper or hear the reports uh, that are written down, but this man had an acute sense of hearing. And he'd heard all these stories, and he said, you know, if I could just get to Jesus, he could do something for me. But I'm a blind man, and as a blind man, I am reduced to being a beggar. And I'm marginalized. And people like beggars in that society, there were so many of them and there were so many calls for them, they just shoved them out of the way and moved on. And so it was a set of unfavorable circumstances. But I want you to notice that there is a second thing here, and that's an undeniable situation of crisis. First of all, there's a crisis for the unknowing mob. They want to be in the presence of Jesus. They want to hear his word. They want to walk with him and talk with him and hear what he has to say. And here is this annoying blind man. And you hear him off in the distance, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. I can't hear anything for this man's cries. I'm trying to hear the word of God, but this man is crying out, and this mob is telling this man, just shut up, just get out of the way. You know, today there are many people who would like to come to Jesus, but there are people standing in their way. Maybe there's somebody in this congregation that has lived a life that is contrary to what you say. Oh, you say, I come here to the church. I hear the messages. I, I live my life in such a way when I'm at church that everybody thinks I'm a really good person, but my family at home knows what I really am. 
And because they know what I really am, they would just discard Jesus and say, look, he's a sham, he's a hoax because you are. We can get in the way of people coming to Jesus. I want you to look at your own heart this morning and say, would you be getting this blind man to Christ or keeping him from Christ? Secondly, there's a crisis for the unseen man. He had two things against him. He had his natural blindness. He could not see where Jesus was. He did not know when Jesus would be passing. He wasn't certain whether Jesus was in front of him or behind him or already into the city. All he knew was Jesus was near somewhere. And not only did he have the crisis of not knowing where Jesus was, but he really had the question of would Jesus do anything for him? You see, what could he offer to Jesus? He was a blind man. He doesn't even really have a name. He simply called the blind man or Bar Timaeus, the son of Timaeus. He's just nobody. He doesn't count for anything. I'm speaking to some of you today who think you're not worth anything. Your life is not really, it really doesn't matter. Down deep in your soul, you're saying, you know, if tomorrow I were gone, nobody would really care. Down deep in the depths of your soul, you know how empty life is. And you've been saying to yourself for a long time, nobody really cares about me. This blind man locked in his darkness and his blindness cries out hoping beyond hope that somehow his voice will penetrate the crowd noise and that somehow Jesus will take notice of him. But there's a third crisis here and that's a crisis for Jesus. You see, while all this crowd was following him, while all this crowd was shouting his name and, and wanting to listen to him and all of that, this crowd was just like the disciples. He was on his way to Jerusalem, and they did not realize who he was or what he was going to do. And the fact is that Jesus knew he was on his way to his death. Now, what if you were told that tomorrow at this time you would be put to death and that you're on your way to eternity and you have but 24 hours to live? Jesus had a little longer than that, but it's that he was walking to his own death. He was going to die a horrible death. And the crowd did not understand. They wanted to see a miracle. They wanted feeding. They wanted somebody to run the Roman dogs into the sea, but they weren't looking for a Savior. The crisis of an unacknowledged Messiah. Even his disciples thought he was going to set up a kingdom. But I want you to notice in the last place the unparalleled success. First of all, I want you to listen to what the Bible says concerning what this man cried out. He said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. The crowd began to hear that over and over again. And this man was saying something that the crowd needed to hear. First of all, he used Jesus' name, Yeshua. He cried out, Yeshua, Yeshua! The name Yeshua means Jehovah saves. His very name is a cry. This man is saying, I know who you are. I know that Jehovah saves. But more than that, listen to what he said. Jesus, thou son of David. You see, this is what most of the people missed. 
He asked the disciples, who am I? And some say Jeremiah and some say one of the prophets and all of this. But this blind man got it. You see, the Bible said there would come one of David's line who would be the king forever, would sit on the throne of his father David. And nobody said that when Jesus was coming along, but this blind man got it. He said, I know who you are. You're the Messiah. God, Jesus saves, and I know, Lord, who you are. You're the Messiah. And then notice his prayer, have mercy on me. You know what he's saying in that prayer? That's the same prayer that all of us need to come to in our life. If we got what we deserved, we would be in hell today. Every single one of us should be burning with parched tongues and eternal flames. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, and that death is separation from God forever in the eternal lake of fire. I know that's not a popular message. It's not one that people like to give today. But the truth of the matter is that we are born sinners on our way to a Christless eternity. And unless Christ has mercy on us, we will all likewise perish. But here's the good news. Jesus was going to the cross. Here's a man who got it. And Christ got his message out through the cry of a blind man. Secondly, I want you to notice the success for this blind crier. The Bible says that Jesus called him out. And uh, when they brought him to Jesus, he asked him a very simple question. He said to him, um, what would thou have me to do unto thee? What do you want me to do? Now, you know, this is like the question that is given at the uh, Miss Universe pageant or Miss America pageant. What would you most wish for in the world? And, of course, the answer is world peace or a good taco recipe or, or something like that. Um, this man was very specific about what he needed. He says, I'm blind and I need to have my sight restored. I need to be able to see. Lord, I know nobody else can do what you can do, but Lord, I ask you to open my eyes that I may see. I just want to be able to see. And notice what the Bible says. Jesus' answer was to him, Receive thy sight. The moment those words came out of the Lord Jesus Mouth the film from this man's eyes. And it's interesting, the word for blindness in the Bible is a word that is used for smoke or film. The film went off this man's eyes. It's like a curtain opened up. And the very first thing this man saw was the face of Jesus Christ. Fanny Crosby was once asked, Miss Crosby, would you like to have your sight back? And she said, oh, no. No, I, I'm, I'm a blind woman. I've been a blind child since birth, and, and now I'm an old woman and all of that. She said, I, wanna, I want the first sight that I have to be the face of my Savior. When my life journey's over and I cross the swelling tide on that bright and cloudy morning, I shall stand. I shall know my Redeemer when I cross the other side by the prints of the nails in his hands. I shall know him. I shall know him when redeemed by his side I shall stand. I shall know him. I shall know him. Oh, to have our eyes opened this morning. This man's eyes were open and Jesus said to him what he would say to you and to me. Thy faith hath saved thee. My friends, all the Bible says that we need do in order to come into a right relationship with Jesus Christ. He paid it all. 
He died on the cross. He was buried. On the third day, he rose again in newness of life. And he says, look unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He said, come unto me. He said, open your eyes and see me. And if you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, instantly you'll become a child of God. Thy faith has saved. And you know what? That led to success for the believing crowd. For the Bible says not only did this man, by the way, this man did something that that rich young man wouldn't do. That rich young man wouldn't follow Jesus because he had great riches, but this man couldn't stop following Christ. You got a home? I don't know. All I know is I'm going with him. You got a family? I don't know. All I know is I'm going with him. I have decided to follow Jesus. And you know what? That was infectious because the Bible says, and immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. This man is praying. Now he was saying, have mercy on me. Now he's saying, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Oh, he couldn't get enough of the doxology. He had to say it over and over again. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. This man was a one-man walking praise team. And you know what happened? Behind him, listen to this crowd. This crowd was saying, shut up, go away, keep quiet, leave us alone. You know what the Bible says? When all the people saw it, they gave praise praise unto God. Suddenly the journey to Jerusalem became a revival meeting. And the people were all praising and thanking God. And it got so big. That crowd got so big and so excited. We're going to read in the next chapter that a wee little man has to climb up a tree just to see what's going on. Because he doesn't want to miss his chance on the other side. Now, my friends, I want to say this to you today. You have an invitation here this morning. There are two groups of people that are being referred to in this passage of Scripture. There are, first of all, those who were God's people that couldn't see. They didn't see the need of that blind man. They didn't see the fact that the Lord Jesus was on his way to the cross. They didn't see all of these things, but you know what they did see? They saw the wonder-working power of Christ. You may not understand everything that God has sent into your life. You may not fully understand the way in which God has been leading you, but you can know this much. The one who holds your hand holds the future. And so you can just learn to trust in Him. No matter what happens, He is able. But if you're like this blind man and Jesus is passing by, he wants to give you eternal life. He wants to let faith save you. If you're here this morning and you've never asked the Lord Jesus Christ to save you, the Bible says, first of all, you have to admit or acknowledge that you're a sinner. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. You have to admit... I'm a sinner. Then secondly, the Bible says you have to believe that Jesus died for you on the cross of Calvary, shed his precious blood as payment to God for your sin. He took your place and paid your, your due. And then the Bible says he was buried and on the third day he came forth in newness of life and that's because God accepted the sacrifice that Christ made. Now, if you will believe that, that Jesus died for you, that he took your sins away and all of that, he'll move into your heart and he'll open your eyes and you'll be able to see things as they ought to be. Would you close your eyes and bow your head, please, this morning? And I